Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our midweek service. Um, behind me, you'll see a picture of the Last Supper. <clears throat> Actually, you can just about make out Jesus washing the disciples' feet. The picture isn't entirely there. It's a green screen, if you know what one of those is. Um, that seems doubly appropriate to have that picture today because Ian's speaking from John chapter 14. Jesus' words in the upper room shortly after he had washed his disciples' feet. It's also appropriate because tomorrow at Chester Cathedral, um, several, in fact, quite a large number of deacons are going to be commissioned to serve in our diocese. Most of you will know at least two of them, Catherine Johnson and Gilly Hall, and perhaps several others beside. So before Ian comes to speak to us, Let's pray together. Eternal God, you've called your church to be a holy priesthood, that it may offer you spiritual sacrifices acceptable through Jesus Christ. Receive our prayers and praises, the devotion of our hearts and the devotion of our lives. And may our worship be down to your great glory now and always. Amen. So we'll listen to or sing our first uh, hymn or song, then we'll have the reading, Ian will speak, and I'll be back then with some prayers before our final song. <laughs> Rejoice, rejoice, 
today is John 14, verse 1 to 7, and I'm going to read from the NIV. So John 14, starting at verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the place, the way to the place where I'm Quite going. Quite a lot to say today, so I'm going to get straight into it. Uh, we're going to be looking particularly at verse 6, so let me pray. Our Father, thank you so much that you have provided a way through your Son, Jesus Christ, to get right with you and to be saved. Help us to believe it, help us to have that conviction and help us to know how to tell others that they might come to know him and be saved as well. For we ask it in his precious name. Amen. So how do we get right with God? Most religions, in fact most people, will, will tell you it's something to do with being a good person, being better, trying harder. Um, we might say uh, you need to pray five times a day facing a certain direction. We might say you need to say enough Hail Marys. You need to bring the right kind of food to the temple for your ancestors. All these different kind of manifestations of this same idea that you need to do something. You need to be a certain type of good person. Um, on the cosmic scales when you die, the amount of good in your life needs to outweigh the amount of bad. And that gets you to heaven. That gets you to God. That gets you to paradise, whatever, however you want to put it. But Jesus says no, doesn't he, in verse 6, very clearly. Um, now straight away claiming that we're right and others are wrong puts us in an awkward place because we're supposed to say each to their own. What's true for me might not be true for you and that's okay. But we're claiming with Jesus there there is such a thing as absolute truth, that what Jesus says is correct and therefore what other religions and belief systems claim is wrong. Buddhism has no gods. Islam has one God, but no trinity. Hinduism has lots of different manifestations of God in lots of different forms. And Christianity, of course, says Jesus is God. And common sense will tell us straight away that they can't all be true at the same time. And some people try and get around this by saying, well, all religions have a grasp, a partial grasp on the truth. They're all basically onto the same thing but no one understands it fully. And you might have heard this metaphor before. Um, imagine that there's an elephant and around this elephant, there's lots of people with blindfolds on and they're all kind of touching the elephant and they're all uh, shouting out what it is based on what they can feel. So the person with the trunk says, all right, I've got a trunk, this is a tree, must be a tree. But then someone else says, no, I'm, I'm touching something flat and they're touching the side of the elephant, but they don't know it's an elephant. So they say, no, it can't be a tree. It doesn't feel like a tree to me. And all the people, because they're blindfolded and they can only go by the part of the elephant they're touching, think that they're right and everyone else is wrong. And the metaphor is supposed to show that all religions are like that. And no one can see the big picture. Now, there's a lot wrong with... That was a fly, sorry. There's a lot wrong with that metaphor, isn't there? But someone suggested to me once that it's as if Jesus removes the blindfold and allows us to see the big picture, allows us to see the elephant. Well, um, so in that scenario, Christianity lets us see the world as it really is. Let's park the elephant for a minute and see what our passage says. And to give a bit of context, the disciples have just been told that Jesus is going to leave them soon. Understandably, they're very upset because they've devoted themselves to him for the past three years. Uh, but as the Christ, he was supposed to bring in God's kingdom. And as they understood it, that meant throwing off Roman oppression and taking up his throne then and there. Of course, God had much bigger ideas. Um, so when Jesus says he's going away, the disciples don't understand. Thomas even says, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? What are you talking about, Jesus? Well, Jesus's answer was then and still is uh, mind blowing. Verse six, I am the way truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What a claim to make. All your efforts count for nothing if you're not going through Jesus. Your hard work, your good deeds, your meticulous adherence to God's law, 
what you need is not those things. What you need is the person of Jesus Christ. Hold that thought. Starting way back at the beginning of the Bible, the Holy God creates the world, not because he has to or because he's lonely, but out of sheer love and graciousness, he makes the world, populates it with animals, creatures, trees, everything. The pinnacle of creation is humans, man and woman, made in God's own image. And their task is to reflect the creator in the world. Just one rule. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, or you will die. Now, mankind, who owes everything to God at this point uh, and forevermore, breaks that one rule, turns around and willfully defies the creator. They break the rule. Now, God would have been perfectly just in erasing Adam and Eve, as he said he would uh, if we disobeyed him. But instead of giving them what they deserved, God, the gracious God, promises a rescuer. He promises that someone would come who would lead his people and who would save them from the mess that they'd made. See, the problem is more fundamental than just eating some fruit that God told them not to eat. It wasn't a case of God being able to say, mm, all right, then don't do it again, Adam. Because when Adam and Eve turned from God in Eden, sin and death entered the world. Sin is ignoring God's rule, doing things our own way, worshipping created things rather than the creator himself. And we're all guilty of that. And sin is first and foremost against God. It's an offence against him and the punishment is death. Not just physically dying, but actually being separated from God, cut off, which is eternal death, which is hell. People from Adam onwards then have been slaves to sin um, under God's death sentence and unable to properly relate to God. Uh, and clean up their own mess. And that death sentence hangs over all of us, all people. So what do we do? Well, let's imagine a scenario. Imagine there's a man in prison for treason. He's plotted to kill the king. He's been found out. He's been tried and found guilty. And he's in prison awaiting his execution. <clears throat> there's absolutely nothing he can do. Um, he's completely at the mercy of his jailers who have him chained up. But one day he hears a rustling outside the cell uh, and a voice speaks in the darkness and says, Hey, do you want to get out of there? I know the way. Well, the man can't believe his luck. So he runs to the bars and presses his face up against the bars to see who it is. And he says, of course, I want to get out. They're going to kill me. I need to escape. So the stranger says, OK, listen very carefully. What you need to do is just try harder. And the stranger retreats back into the shadows and is gone. And the man breaks down in tears, all thoughts of escape ruined by this ridiculous advice. Any religion that tells you to try harder to reach heaven is setting you up to fail right from the start. The man waiting for his execution doesn't need good advice. He needs good news. He needs to know that his sentence has been thrown out. He needs someone to come and unlock his cell and his chains and give him his freedom again. How can you work off your debt to an infinitely holy God when your heart itself is a slave to the very sin you're trying to pay off? You can't. Just trying harder and being better is not going to cut it because we're not just basically good people who need to be trying harder. We're bad people. We're on death row. We're chained up by sin. So we can put most religions in the bin straight away, can't we? What humanity needs is not a self-help scheme. It's a self-giving saviour. Someone to come and actually clean us up, to set us free, to remove the death sentence we've earned for sticking two fingers up at God's holy love. Skip forward some thousands of years and we have this man, Jesus Christ, saying, I am the way, the truth and the life. You can come to God through me. Is this God's promised rescuer? People need this revelation so their eyes will be open to truth and they need life because in their sin they're dead and cut off from God. Can Jesus deliver? Well, we all know that just saying words isn't enough. I could proclaim myself King of Cheadle. But it's just words. I'm not King of Cheadle. <laughs> so how is Jesus going to back up this amazing claim? 
Well, something happened 2000 years ago, didn't it? That changed the world. Everything before that was leading up to this moment and everything since has been built from this moment. And that something was the humiliation, crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection and ascent to heaven of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The centre point in history. You see, we don't take Jesus at, Jesus at his word just because um, he was a good teacher or uh, because he seems like he was a decent, honest bloke. We take him at his word because his actions proved that he was who he said he was, the saviour. Jesus Christ was put on a cross and killed and put in a tomb. On the third day, he was physically raised back to life by the power of God. He appeared to his followers who saw him and touched him. There were over 500 witnesses, most of whom were still alive uh, when Paul wrote his New Testament letters and could easily have come forward and discredited him if what he was claiming wasn't true. Jesus then ascended to heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. He wasn't just a nice bloke. He wasn't just a good guy who helped the poor and the sick. He was the Messiah and all that that means. He was the one who'd been promised to the world right from the beginning when humans first decided we'll rule ourselves and it went wrong. So back to the scenario, as the man is crying in his cell, he hears another voice and this voice says, stay there, I'm coming in. And the man's cell door opens and a stranger walks in and silently unlocks his shackles and says, I've spoken to the king. I'm going to take your place. You can go. You're free. That's Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus Christ came into the world to take our sin, to shoulder the punishment, that death sentence that we deserve on his own back and to die in our place. The punishment for sin is death, but Jesus has died instead of me and the punishment has been paid. There's nothing left to pay. I'm free. And so is Jesus. The resurrection is a massive stamp across history saying paid in full. No sin left to pay, so no death left to die. He is alive and so he can offer that eternal life to anyone who follows him. Every other belief system will tell you that ultimately it's up to you to get to God or to glory or to heaven or to whatever. You need to do it yourself. But if the Bible is right about our condition, then that is impossible. Christianity is unique in having a God who's died for you. Allah hasn't died for you. Buddha didn't die for you. Muhammad didn't die for you. None of the Hindu gods ever died for you. Jesus Christ took on human flesh and hung on a cross at the hands of the very creatures he'd made to pay the death required by the sin that enslaved them. And he doesn't require gifts or sacrifices or that you pray a certain way or that you stay away from certain kinds of food. He says, follow me. Trust me. So a religion that denies Jesus and what he did can't stand if what we've heard is true. All other belief systems start in the wrong place. They assume that humans can reach God by their own efforts. But we can't. If you don't accept that Jesus has taken the punishment that you deserve in your place, then that punishment is still yours to bear. You're still in the cell. You can't be in the presence of God and so you cannot be with God. There's no room for each to their own. This is serious and it's true. Jesus in one short sentence in verse 6 consigns all other belief systems to the bin. So as we finish that elephant metaphor, it's partly true, isn't it? It's not bad. However, it's not enough. When Jesus removes the blindfold, it's not just that we see the elephant and we go, ah, that's what I was looking at all along. When our blindfolds are removed, we're led round the back of the elephant and we see a cross. And we hear Jesus by our side say, this is for you. You see, people who follow other faiths aren't almost their Christians. Islam, Hinduism, atheism, they're not um, Christianity with the blindfold on. They're an offence to the holy God who made the universe and calls it mine. Christianity is not one of many choices. It's a unique concept. It's the truth. It's totally distinct and totally unique. 
Those blindfolded people stumbling around the elephant are looking in completely the wrong place. And they need Jesus to show them that. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. His death and resurrection stand as historical, verifiable proof that that is true. And that means there's just one way to God, and that is to believe in Jesus Christ. Now, if that's true, the final challenge for us, there are a heck of a lot of people who don't know that. So pick one person this week, get to praying for them and get to work helping them to take that blindfold off. Amen. Well, thanks for that, Ian. Um, we're now going to pray. Um, as I said at the beginning, we're going to pray for the deacons who are being commissioned and not being ordained because that involves a laying on of hands and that's not possible. And neither is a service together in the cathedral possible. So let me read out the names of the deacons to be commissioned tomorrow evening. Phil Bishop from Weatherham, Rob Croft from Christleton, Sam Durden Hollenby, Hool, Helen Eccles, Nutsford, Murray Flint, Stockport and Brinnington, many of you will know Murray, Gilly Hall, Cheadle, Hannah Hevladjajan, Larsh Cum Saltney, Catherine Johnson, Cheadle, both her and Gilly are all hallows by the way, Vanessa Layfield, Nantwich, Paul Lewis, Paulton Lanslin, Anna Layden, Chester Christchurch, Martin Makin, Bradbury, St. Mark, David Murray, Sale, Jean Pilling, Thornley Moors, Anthony Rigby, Elworth, George Roach, Higher Bevington, Danny Sedano, Frank B. with Greasby, Francis Skinner, Great Meals, Richard Skinner, Hoylake, Simon Stride, Staley Bridge, Christine Turner, Seacombe, Debbie Wilkinson, Birkenhead Priory, and Claire Wilson in Bunbury. So let's pray a prayer first for deacons, and then a second prayer today will be uh, a CMS prayer, remembering our mission partners, particularly today is the day in the church's year when we remember John and Henry Venn, who began the church mission society back in the 18th century. A prayer then for deacons. Since the time of the apostles, Lord, you have inspired the church to appoint members to assist in particular ways in its mission. We give you thanks for how you blessed your church, for how you are continuing to build and shape your church, and for giving us the joy today of commissioning, actually it's tomorrow evening, commissioning new deacons to serve you in the church. We'd ask your blessing upon these new deacons, that they may know true humility and be faithful in their service for you. Remind them of the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in fulfilling the ministry you gave to him, came to serve rather than be served, sought the needs of others rather than seeking his own, ministered to people without prejudice and with courage and determination, and loved people unconditionally. We ask you, O Lord our God, that you pour generosity into their lives, that you fill them with your love and your compassion, that they may see their brothers and sisters as you see them, and that they are equipped to carry out the duties that they are being appointed to, in full. O oh Lord our God, we pray for these new deacons and need all of your people that you would fill us anew with your Holy Spirit that we may be hearers and doers of your word, ministers to all, friends of the poor, voice of the voiceless and servants of our Lord Jesus Christ and we ask this for his name and for his glory. Amen. And before I say the CMS prayer, let's pray for all our mission partners. You may know some in particular. Uh, St Cuthbert's CMS partners are Paul and Sarah Tester, who we dearly love. Let's remember too 
the reading, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth and the life. Let's serve others by sharing the good news of him and praying for all who do so. And so the CMS community prayer, Lord Jesus, as you have entered into our life and death, and in all the world, you call us into your death and risen life. Forgive us our sins and draw as we pray by the power and encouragement of your spirit into an exchange of gifts and needs, joys and sorrows, strength and weakness with your people everywhere. That with them we may have your grace to break through every barrier, to make disciples of all peoples and share your love with everyone. For your glory's sake. Amen. A few moments of silence for our own prayers and thoughts. And now we'll join together in the Lord's Prayer in the traditional version. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this midweek service. You can get onto Zoom. Remember, you can be at the, um, the commissioning service tomorrow evening. That is Thursday at 7 p.m. I think it is. Chester Cathedral. Go to our Facebook page uh, and you'll get the details or the Diocese of Chester website. And so our last hymn. Redemption, the purchase of love.